Ladies and gentlemen, I give you a professor of educational technology at Newcastle University, UK, and previously a visiting professor at MIT, Professor Sugata Mitra. Thank you. Gosh, this is scary. <laughs> you know, uh, in England, um, our idea of a very large conference is 125 people. <laughs> so, so nobody's going to believe this. <laughs> well, I uh, have a challenge here today. Since I came in yesterday, I met several of you, all of whom said, we've seen all your talks. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh my God, thank you. <laughs> what am I going to do tomorrow? <laughs> so, so that's challenge number one. Challenge number two, is that, you know, as professors get older, they tend to ramble on and on and on. <laughs> and finally, their time runs out and they haven't actually made their main point. <laughs> so I have to make sure that that doesn't happen. And what should the message be was uh, something that I was thinking about all the way from Calcutta to California. Um, I thought there's one way to put it. I started out on all of this way back, you know, in the 1980s, really. The hole in the wall happened in 1999. And I uh, continued with that work until today. And I saw the world change from being a computer-using educator to a world where computers use educators. Not one computer, not two computers, not a dozen. Five billion interconnected computers. We don't see them, and we call them the cloud. But this is the story of the cloud using education. Let's see if I can get there. I have uh, my last challenge, <laughs> which is that there is a first part of the story and there's a second part of the story. For you, I think the second part of the story is more important today because up until now, I used to say, here are the experiments. This is what they're doing. I stopped there. I didn't say, so what? So what should you, as a teacher, do? I'm, I'm getting the, to the beginnings of being able to say that, okay? Just the beginnings. And it's, a, um, it's kind of an exciting message there of what should you do? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can uh, get that point across. I also do an exercise every year, which is that I take some of the mainline published articles on the internet, the ones that have been you know, viewed the most and uh, that sort of thing. And I put them all together into a single document and then put the whole lot into Wordle <laughs> and see what it brings. Well, this year, this is what it did. Okay, as you might expect, you know, children in big letters, groups, learning, internet, self-organization. But there was, you know, unfortunately and strangely, one word missing, the word teacher. What happened? Where did we all go? <laughs> I, I, I kept staring at that thing and said, my God, I don't believe this. You know, well, I mean, it's possible that I, you know, didn't select all the right articles or whatever, but I do this every year, and the word teacher uh, 
generally appears somewhere or the other. He wasn't. So, where did we go? So the first bit of the story, I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can. The story of obsolescence. And uh, you, you've, you've heard this one before, but this is how it goes. That we, we just transited from a different age. And if you think about it, it's only in the last hundred years or so that we have been experimenting with social systems of governance that are different from empires. And I say experimenting. And not even particularly successfully, I think, so far. So before that, for 5,000 years, we had a system. And that system didn't have computers and didn't have anything. It didn't have telephones. It didn't have you know, aeroplanes, nothing at all. What it did have and needed in large numbers are these, these people. What were these people like? They must be identical to each other. They must obey orders as soon as an order is issued. They must not ask questions. These people who used to do all the computing for us, what did they need? They needed to know how to read and write, to understand one person's handwriting, you know, one person should be able to understand another person's handwriting, so cursive writing with good style. Um, look at instructions, follow them, understand them and follow them, comprehension. Don't ask questions, and for heaven's sake, don't be creative. You don't want a creative clerk, do you? <laughs> And then these people stand at the same place, do the same thing over and over again for eight hours, 10 hours every day, understand instructions, follow them, don't ask questions, and this time around, strictly do not be creative. Can you imagine a creative assembly line worker? <laughs> and there was, and we needed them in millions and millions and millions for thousands and thousands of years. And we produced a superbly constructed engine to do that. There you go, our engine. Well, somebody has to say that. The second thing that happened in recent times is dematerialization. That's a strange word. It used to happen in fairy tales that you shake your magic wand at something and it just poof, disappears. But it happens very regularly. Let me give you some examples. You remember that? <laughs> it disappeared. Where did it go? Into the mobile phone. You remember that? But maybe there are one or two still floating around. But it disappeared into the mobile phone. This one... <laughs> well, I'm glad you, somebody laughed because... <laughs> I, I was giving a talk in Boulder, Colorado last year to, uh, you know, students, 20, 22 or something like that. And I brought up this picture and there was silence. So I said, guys, and then somebody from the back said, what's that? <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's a slide rule. It disappeared into the mobile phone. Remember that one? very cherished objects, it vanished. I won't even tell you where it went. <laughs> Remember that? Kodak filed for bankruptcy, I think last year. It disappeared into your pocket. Remember those sheaves of them inside the glove compartment? <laughs> they disappeared. <laughs> Guess where? <laughs> so what's all this? What's, what's going on? Why are things disappearing? And what is happening to them? They all exist. I mean, music exists, and arithmetic exists, and maps exist. Except that they're all ones and zeros. Clouds and clouds of ones and zeros. Utterly 
non-human. If I gave you those piles of ones and zeros on a piece of paper, you'd just stare at it. I once did a study on that. I took Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, digitized it, made an MP3 out of it, took the string of ones and zeros, and applied a simple statistical rule on it to say, is there anything meaningful in this? Statistics said, it's random. It's a random string of ones and zeros. 50% ones, 50% zeros. Beethoven? Well, I won't tell you the whole story, but I, I did find, finally, where the meaning was. It was in a very strange place, but not in those ones and zeros. But I'm going to tell you about an example of something that changed relatively recently, transportation. This was how people moved from one point to another for thousands and thousands of years. Horse-drawn carriages. You got into the back and you told the driver, I want to go to so-and-so place, and the coachman, he sort of took you along. All that changed when somebody invented the internal combustion engine. So then we said, well, that's cool. I mean, those horses, we don't need them anymore. Poor things, they've done their bit. Now we're going to replace them with internal combustion engines. I think in those days, people thought that instead of those two horses, there'll be two internal combustion engines, and the accelerator will be tied to, the, to, to two pieces of string, and the coachman will sort of go like that. But that's not what happened. Something utterly unexpected happened. The coachman disappeared. The passengers became the drivers, okay? Now you listen with our subject in mind, education. The passengers became the drivers, and when passengers became the drivers, they did all kinds of, you know, passengers are you and me, when we become drivers, we, we make some strange uh, discoveries and inventions. For example, we invented drunken driving. We invented passing from the wrong side, <laughs> of uh, sideswiping other people, running over other people. So traffic lights, traffic policemen, roads, road safety rules, licensing authorities, everything changed. Everything had to change to keep us, the drivers, to keep us, the passengers, uh, as drivers. But one thing we never did we never brought the coachman back. So I thought that I'd, this is where my example would end, but it didn't actually, because something stranger is happening, and it's happening right here in this state. Cars that drive themselves. You all know, you've all heard about it. Uh, they're, they're strange things, I've actually had a ride in one. And, uh, you know, they're extraordinarily safe. The, the, the car that drives itself drives like a 90-year-old with poor eyesight. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> you couldn't have it safer. <laughs> and I love the idea. I love the idea of popping out of a bar, getting into my driverless car and saying, take me home. <laughs> But something really strange is going to happen now. This time around, no one's going away. We, the passengers, are still there. It's just that we're even more comfortable than before. But something else is going away. Driving is going away. You will have one day grandchildren who will ask you, what does driving mean? And you're going to say, there used to be a wheel. You had to hold on to the wheel. <laughs> There's a stick. You had to pull on the stick. <laughs> there were pedals. You had to pump the pedals. <laughs> and the car would move. And your grandchild would say, don't be silly. <laughs> so, so, so not just things, but strangely enough, Concepts can dematerialize. So that one really gets me. Because up to this point, I can say, okay, teacher, coachman, you know, riding, change the horses, 
put in internal combustion engines. The passengers take over as the drivers. The coachman goes away. And then driving goes away. What does that mean? Learning goes away. Knowing goes away. I haven't even started working on what that means. But I want to leave it in your head. The hole in the wall is an old story. I won't tell you a, a lot about it, but I need to show that one little video just because I owe the children. The very first day, what was the hole in the wall? Just a computer stuck into a wall, 1997, uh, 1999, with an internet connection that I got with some difficulty. No explanation, three feet off the ground. When you put anything three feet off the ground, the first people that come there are three feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> What did they do? Well, they just started surfing. How? We don't know. It's just not supposed to happen. How did they understand the English? How did they understand what that machine was? How did they know what the internet was? How could they download something? How could they load games? <laughs> There was only one clue staring at me which I didn't see. Groups and no supervision. As a teacher, it never ever occurred to me that taking away supervision and restricting the resource will produce learning, will amplify learning. It went against everything that I knew. So I didn't take the clue. It took me 16 years to figure that out. I did experiment after experiment to see what would happen. Okay, so what? When, once they've learned how to surf, then what happens? Well, about four or five months down the line, they run into search engines. In those days, it was Alta Vista. <laughs> and the local teachers start to, started to report in Delhi, the local uh, slum school teachers, saying, you know, something's happened to the children, Professor Mitra. I said, what? Their English has become perfect. And you know, they're quoting from some strange places. I said, strange places like what? Oh, you know, Harvard Business Review and things like that. <laughs> I, said, I said, I see. And then I thought, my God, what have I done? I mean, they're just, they're just picking up stuff like that, copying it off the screen and handing it over back in school. They're not learning. There was a clue that I had missed completely. How in that ocean of information were they copying down the right things. I couldn't figure that out. It took me 10 years to figure it out. Once again, there were these two common things. No supervision, unstructured groups. As I went on through these experiments, basically asking children to do harder and harder things, uh, you know, math and stuff like that. It became like a, uh, like an addiction for me. I would go from village to village, put in their hole in the wall computer, call the children, and the way you do it is uh, you put in some stuff after they've learned how to use the basic machine. So the children say, what do you do? What have you put in there? Uh, you'd say, oh, I put in uh, um, quantum electrodynamics. So the children, and they barely know any English. What's that? So let's say they're 12 years old. The way the method works is you say, well, I don't quite know what it is, but I know it's very important. And anyway, you're never going to be able to figure it out. <laughs> and then you go away. <laughs> Try doing that with a bunch of 12-year-olds, and you'll see what they do. So I... 
went from experiment to experiment just to make sure that I was all right, I, that what I was seeing was not sort of cooked up in my own mind. I started publishing the results into international peer-reviewed publications, initially with difficulty, and then it became easier and easier. As the entire teaching community started to say, there's something really odd that we've missed. We still hadn't quite understood the cloud. One thing that helped this whole process was the existence of a non-threatening adult. What I found was that when the children do this kind of thing, you know, milling around and pushing and shoving and playing with the internet and looking for something, if there's someone there who says, wow, that's fantastic, how did you do that? You know, when I was your age, I could have done nothing like that. And the children will say, oh, that's nothing. Let me show you what else we can do. And they'll go one step further. I realized that this was the method of the grandmother. Oh, I mean, that's a romantic way of putting it, the method of the grandparents, which is quite different from the method of the parent or the teacher. The grandparent method, if done correctly, uses admiration as the engine. So back in England, I put out an appeal into a newspaper saying, if you're a British grandmother, if you have the internet and a web camera, can you give me one hour of your time for free every week? Not much to ask for. In a couple of weeks, I got hundreds. You know, I know, I know more British grandmothers than anyone in this room. <laughs> I was just joking. That cloud has grown. You know, it's called the granny cloud. <laughs> It's grown a lot since those days. It's not just grannies, it's actually not grannies at all. I mean, there are all kinds of, there are young men and women, there are, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of people, uh, teachers, active teachers, retired teachers, basically people who are interested in children and who have an hour to give in a week. There are many from California, for example. And what do they do? I beam them in over Skype into places where good teachers can't go. It's as simple as that. And I tell, give them one instruction that I learned through all these 16 years. Don't teach. Do whatever else you want. Do not teach. So the granny cloud started out in, I think, around nine, uh, 2008 or so. It's basically a wall-sized thing. What's my lesson in there? Don't put it onto tiny screens, okay? That doesn't work. And don't put it onto a massive screen like that. Children don't want a granny that looks like King Kong talking to them. <laughs> so, so, put it at their level and life size. Then it, then it becomes real. And what do they do? Well, they just talk like this. Excellent. Give yourselves a clap. We absolutely. Hello, I, I'm, I'm Tim. How are you? I'm all right. Have you heard of the uh, a footballer called Wayne Rooney? Yes. What, what sort of bear does Wayne Rooney look like? A teddy bear. A teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> so, a general conversation. I'll show you in a, in a minute what that does. But the presence of this friendly mediator can improve self-organized learning. I used to sort of leave it at that, but I, I would now add an experiment which you might want to, to, to try. Take your best math teacher, put him into a classroom, put him into a self-organized environment with, you know, computers and uh, not rows and columns of uh, um, chairs, and tell him that you conduct a session. And he says, well, what shall I do today? Should I do a bit of algebra? So I said, no, 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 you don't do that. Today you're going to do the history of still life watercolors. <laughs> and then watch, you'll see the power of the method because he will achieve exactly what the art teacher would have achieved if he does it right. So all this got put together in England and called a self-organized learning environment. So what do you do to make it? Well, you basically turn the hole-in-the-wall experiment inside out. So you take a classroom, take out all the furniture, 
put in comfortable seating, stools, for example, work quite well, put in a few computers with big screens. The walls of the classroom should preferably be glass, so that, you know, if you have big screens facing the glass wall, then standing outside, you can see every single screen. Let's say you put in five. Bring in 20 children and give them some, ask them a question. That question's most important. It's quite an art trying to build the question. Um, just to give you an example, with seven-year-olds, I did a, a session like that in London last year. Uh, the teacher said, Sugata, I'm going to, uh, I, I said to the teacher, what were you going to do if I hadn't come? And, sh and she said, I was going to do the most boring subject on the planet. So I said, what's that? And she said, gum health. So I said, gum health? <laughs> so, so she said, well, gum health, you do that. <laughs> okay, so off I went to the seven-year-olds. So I said, okay, does anybody have a shaking tooth? So obviously seven-year-olds, I said several of them. So I said, I, want, I have a question for you. Why is it that we're born without teeth, usually, um, then we grow teeth, then they fall off, then they grow back, they stay on for quite a while, then they drop off again, <laughs> and the second time around, they never grow back. Now the seven-year-old said, yeah, that's right. They never go back the second time. I said, yes, that's my question. Why not? Well, to cut the long story short, they found out. And it was gum health. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's very, very simple. It's just an environment which is open. Remember, I'm trying to simulate the hole in the wall which was in fields and open spaces. So, glass. Restriction of the resource. Very fast broadband, but only a few. So then you don't have to tell the children to make groups, because they obviously have to. So, but then they make their own self-organizing groups. You don't make the groups. You don't say you and you and you work together. Let them do it themselves. At best, you can take one and tell him to be the supervisor. I generally make a rule saying, you can't talk to me, I can't talk to you. This is to simulate the lack of supervision bit. The only person who is our communication bridge, in case there's a, 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 a chance of bodily injury, which happens once in a while, <laughs> is that little fellow who is the supervisor. He can talk to me and he can talk to the kids as well. He has to sort out all problems. And then you let chaos happen. So this is what it looks like. There he is, a ferocious supervisor. This is in Melbourne. Total number of protons, giving it a net positive or negative elect electrical charge. The net charge on an ion is equal to the number of protons in the ion minus the number of electrons. Those were 11 year olds talking first year undergraduate physics. 35 minutes. So, you, but then it's all very fine. This is so far a very nice story. How do you do it and why should you? The curriculum that you have doesn't ask you to do it that way. The assessment system doesn't ask you to do it that way. So we've got a challenge. How do you do it in the middle of a system which believes in exactly the opposite of everything I said? And I can quite understand my teacher friends all around the world in all the five continents say this to me. Why is it like that? And then I see to my, for myself the power of 5,000 years of one system and how hard it is to shake that. So the soul as an idea has spread all around the world. 
Many, many teachers, tens of thousands of them practice it. And they blog about it and they publish it and they do all sorts of things. They always report results like the ones that I told you. But what happens next? Well, first of all, I must also tell you a little side story, which is that it uh, impacted popular culture. It generated films like Slumdog Millionaire, the idea of the hole in the wall and of self-directed chaotic learning. It took a school in Mexico from the bottom of the league table in arithmetic to the very top by a teacher whom I don't even know and who said, you know, I read this guy's work. It's pretty simple. I just applied it and I don't know what happened. The class just went up. Sports commentators started to say, maybe we should use hole in the wall techniques to do uh, uh, you know, better batting uh, techniques or better bowling techniques and so on. So it went all over the place, but what didn't get solved is the challenge of assessment. This is an office from 1910 or so. It could be Boston or it could be Calcutta or it could be Vancouver. They all looked exactly the same. There were rows of clerks, a floor supervisor walking up and down, making sure that you're not talking, you're not being creative, you're not asking to questions, you're not talking to the other guy, etc. You're doing your work, which is copying down things from one thing to another. Remember what we do in school? So here is what it looked like, 1910. Here is what an examination room in India looks like. Do you see that? You see who we are preparing our children for? They're dead, those employers. <laughs> that world is gone, <laughs> but we're still preparing our children for them. So what should we prepare them for? Well, this is what a modern office looks like most of the time. Doesn't it remind you of the hole in the wall? Almost exactly, I could superimpose those two pictures. So if you have to prepare your children for this world, then shouldn't the examination system look like this? You know? I... Thank you, that, that means a lot. Um, you know, just recently in Calcutta, there was a newspaper article said, which said, believe it or not, Calcutta police to ensure that devices are not allowed into examination halls. I said, God, what does that mean? I mean, what's going to happen two years down the line when the devices become so small or implanted that you can't even tell? <laughs> you know? What are you going to do? You're going to put them through an MRI scanner. <laughs> you know? So I put that out on my Facebook page and one of my English friends wrote back a really lovely line, which I think applies to any exam. He said, do you realize that that examination day is the only day in their life that these children will not have their mobile phones with them? <laughs> so, so why not? Why not allow the mobile phone in? Why not allow the internet in? Why not allow Siri in, for heaven's sake? What will it do to the driverless car? If we manage to do this, and I've been going from country to country saying, somebody try, please. It will change the whole system. If you're standing in front of your class and you know that all these children, during their tests or their exams, are going to have access to the internet, your entire teaching strategy will change. What will you do? You'll send them to the internet room. And you'll say, listen, you must learn how to search properly. The internet can have different points of view. You must learn how to determine which is right, which is wrong. When you talk to your friends, don't just waste time. There's very little time in an exam. Have a pointed conversation and get to the truth because that's how they'll have to live. The guy who is setting the examination question paper, he has to change completely. There's not much point in saying how tall is the Eiffel Tower? How many seconds will that take? Um, it has to be a different question. But you could ask a question like, why was the Eiffel Tower built? Now that's a good question. It has a story. The internet has that story, but it's covered in mist. Try it sometime in your classroom and you'll see what fun that is. 
So, in 2013, I got uh, a prize, the TED Prize. And uh, it was big issue, you know, a million dollars. So I was obviously quite very happy, you know. <laughs> I, was, I was going to call my bank, say, guys, get ready, get ready, you know. No, no more of those three-digit numbers for me. <laughs> it's all going to change. When Ted called and said, we don't give you the money. We ask you what you'll do with the money if you had it. <laughs> so I made a plan, a three-year plan, and I gave the money to the university. Why? Because, you know, when you give money to my university or to most universities, then they ask you questions like, on the 26th of February, you took a taxi cab <laughs> and you paid $12.5 for it. According to us, it should have been 9.2. <laughs> what did you do with the extra dollar? <laughs> so, you know, that sort of thing. I wanted that because, you know, a million dollars can just vanish if you don't have that kind of fiscal control over it. So I told the university accountant guys, I said, just, well, what I actually said is just screw me. <laughs> the plan was to build seven schools in the cloud. Five would be in India, two would be in England, and they would stretch across uh, different socio-economic and geographic uh, areas, starting from the really remote, where there's nothing at all, to middle-class urban England. They would be identical, the schools. And over a three-year period, we would collect the data to show where the cloud can take children. I'm halfway through it. So the, what is the school in the cloud? Well, you know what the hole in the wall is, unsupervised groups of children, lack of resources or restriction of resource. The granny cloud, admiration, as the mechanism for driving. The self-organized learning environment, a safe, publicly visible space, large screens, comfortable, unsupervised. Well, I finished building that, it took about a year. Here's what they look like. This one's in a town called Killingworth, England. Inside, I put in an Xbox. <laughs> and, and my teacher friend, Amy, she said, you are nuts, I mean, how can you do this? They're not going to do anything else except play with that Xbox. So I put down a challenge for the teachers of Killingworth. I said, if you can do something, anything, and show me that the children were not playing with the Xbox, then you've beaten the Xbox. If you can't, then the Xbox has beaten you. You better do something about that. Well, she did. She won that hand. As you can see over here, there's only one child on that Xbox, and here are the others. And there's Amy in the background biting her nails and telling me I don't... <laughs> and saying, I don't believe this. This is Kalkaji, New Delhi. It's a government school for girls, where with great difficulty I built a school in the cloud. The teachers... Uh, firstly, the 50% vacancies in teachers. The teachers um, are, they, they just could not grasp the concept itself. But all this did was, they said, we can't understand what you're trying to say, but you go ahead and do it. I like them for that. They said, you do it, we want to see. So I started the school in the cloud in there. It's been about a year, and I'm going to show you one girl. I wish I could do a before and after video, but I don't want to do that because, you know, she's not a microbe that we are studying. It's insulting to do a before and after video. She knew no English at all. She was stumbling when we started. Here she is. And I want to be a lawyer because sometimes the right people be made wrong. But I want to be the right people right. I will give them justice. So I want to be a lawyer. Okay.
Thank you. Thank you again. So on we went, and there are stories after stories. Here's Newton Eycliffe in England with a granny on the wall, a South American granny. This is what it looks like inside. It's, it looks like, uh, it's got astroturf. It looks like the outdoors. It's got glass walls separating it from the actual outdoors. England has beautiful countryside if you're looking at it from indoors through glass. <laughs> so, so, so that, that's what they did there. And it's, it's just beautiful. It's got park benches and gas lights and computers. This is Fulton in Maharashtra, India. It's uh, on the western coast. Uh, a, a pretty place and a, and a small little school there. This is the insides in Fulton. You can see over there the, the granny screen, which is uh, you know, at, at the level of the children. There's a, a village called Chandrakona in Bengal. Um, uh, now we're getting to the remoter of the areas. That's what it looks like from the outside. That's what it looks like from the inside. If uh, you can see on your screen in the far end, you see uh, not a granny, but a grandpa. <laughs> he is a friend of mine, he is from Australia. And I don't know what he is going to do to the accents of the children. <laughs> <laughs> an inside view. This is my remotest. It's a village called Korakati. It's in an area called the Sundabans where the Ganges, if you remember the map of India, on the eastern side, the Ganges comes in and meets the sea, forming the biggest river delta in the world. Not only uh, the, a big river delta, but a dynamic one. Dynamic as in, if you go to, uh, you know, they're sharecropping farmers, they're very poor people. If you go to a farmer and say, how much land do you have? And he sort of scratches his head, um, maybe one, maybe two acres. So he said, what do you mean maybe one or maybe two? He says, no, some days I have two acres, and on some days I have one. <laughs> it's like that. It's incredible. It's like another planet. Um, it's got no electricity, no health care, no education. Um, as a matter of fact, all it has are crocodiles, tigers, and the hooded cobra. <laughs> I've actually seen them roaming around, and the children treat them like cats. So here is Korakati, took some building. That's the inside. It looks nice. It's solar powered, but the internet is very flaky. When I first went, I couldn't get the internet from anywhere. I took a receiver and I raised it on bamboo poles. At about 45 feet off the ground, I got a eight Mbps 3G signal. That's the way we get it, but then it's a very windy place, so if the receiver moves, you lose the internet. When you lose the internet, it looks like that, empty. When you do have the internet, it's full. This is the biggest of the lot. It's in another village in Bengal called Gocharan. It is a 40-seater. The, the structure is two concentric hexagons, so that forms six logical areas. One is admin, five are uh, uh, souls, self-organized learning environments. That's what the inside looks like. And all this got done in 2014. So where are we now? Well, there's a filmmaker called Jerry Rothwell making a documentary on this for Sundance. Uh, Ted ordered that. And here is Jerry's very short report on the schools in the cloud. What is the future of learning? Schools as we know them now, they're obsolete. My wish is to build a facility where children go on intellectual adventures driven by the big questions which their mediators put in. It will be called a school in the cloud. Make your own groups, you can change your groups, you can walk around, you can look at other people's work. It's anything but a classroom, right? 
Burakati may or may not be different from the schools of England, but that's what we are going to look for. Computer is not a big deal. It is a big computer and a big deal. It is a big deal. It is a big deal. It is a big deal. It's seven minutes from zero to the first game appearing on the screen. And I've seen that happen for the last 15 years everywhere in the world. So I don't think progress is going to be a problem. Almost any kind of order which occurs spontaneously always happens at what's called the edge of chaos. And that's what a soul is. You take some children, you get them into an environment which allows them to be disordered, and then you wait for order to come, and along with order comes learning. <laughs> the worst of the possibilities is that you come back here five years later to be a Kaushi. The best of the possibilities is that if the assessment system is changed, you will find it's packed all the time. It's not about making learning happen, it's about letting it happen. So that's more or less where I am right now. Uh, the data is kind of coming in. Uh, English reading comprehension seems to be the first point of impact, where you see dramatic changes. There are others, but I don't want to talk about it because with my research team, I, I keep telling them, do not form an opinion. Let the data speak for itself, and there's still one half of that data still to come. So if you call me back um, 18 months from now, <laughs> I can tell you what the data says. So that's a school in the cloud, and there's just one last bit to, to talk about. How does this happen? Ever since the, uh, 1999, when I did the hole in the wall, I've had this question thrown at me. But how is it happening? And I still don't know, for a very simple reason. If you take a group of children who are doing something marvelous, and if I appear there wearing a tie and say, what are you doing? The children generally turn around and say, nothing. <laughs> okay? You cannot find out that way. It's ethically not right to point a camera at them. So if I've tried that by telling them. I said, look, do you mind if there's a camera out here? Doesn't work. All that they do is spend time making faces at the camera. <laughs> so I don't know. But I can guess. I don't have a formal background in education. All my formal background is in theoretical physics. So I had to turn to my old subject for a guess. The guess is this. What we are looking at here is what in physics we would call emergent phenomenon. We have physicists sometimes make romantic names. This time they made a good job of it. We call it the edge of chaos. So if you have a perfectly ordered system, and if you have a completely disordered system, both are quite boring. The perfectly ordered system remains exactly as it is. The perfectly disordered system well, is just bouncing around. If you make them meet, there is a thin edge. It's the edge of chaos where things happen. Sometimes we call it spontaneous order. I think what we are looking at is spontaneous order. We saw those two girls, little girls, talking to each other with that hilarious conversation. You know, I had told my research team, go there every two weeks and take your data. And this one of the girls brought back this video and said, you've got it wrong. They're saying, it's going to take a long time to learn all this. It's going to take at least three days. <laughs> so, so, so the edge of chaos is like that. And we have example after example of that in nature. This is an orchid from Peru. Does it know what a monkey is? We have no way to find out. Why did it do that? Over how much period of time? Emergent phenomenon. This, drops of water, 
the place where we live, termite cathedrals, do they know civil engineering? How did they learn how to make the foundations for that huge structure? Emergent. So this is it, this is my guess. And I, and I repeat to you, it's a guess, it's a guess, it's a guess. It may not be right. You have to tell me. Because I've tried everything I can. I, I'm not an elementary school teacher, so I have to go from school to school to try these things. You're there where the action is. You tell me, does it exist or does it not? Because it's a very, very important guess. We are letting our children out there into the cloud with their devices and themselves. What will happen? I think we all have that question in our mind. Well, I know lots of bad things can happen. But if this is true, then the driverless car will go where none of us can imagine. And in that, I think, will lie the future of learning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You still want to do Q&A? Am I on time? Yeah, we're good. Thank you. You'll stay here. I'll be. Thank you, Professor Mitra. Come on, guys, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're fired up. And, and, and I want to thank you for your response on Twitter. I posted out a question during his talk to let you all know that we're going to be soliciting questions from among the audience, both here live as well as the overflow rooms and on Twitter. So if you would like to ask a question to Professor Mitra, add the hashtag QMitra to your tweet, and we'll look through and we'll See if we can flag those, and then I'll ask those questions of you. And a couple of them already come in, actually. Uh, one is mostly just a, a compliment from Don Ha. She said, Professor Mitchell just blew my mind. <laughs> Self-organized learning environment, hashtag soul, hashtag Q15, hashtag Q Mitra. So that's just a compliment. <laughs> we'll start with the softball. See? All right. <laughs> uh, someone asked a question here. Uh, Lance Wren, how do you think soul would look if applied in America? Where do we start? How do we gain trust from current school systems and administrators? That's a good question. I uh, didn't bring that up. You know, what are the problems? But you know, what my, uh, the biggest problem that I face right now is not from the system, and definitely not from teachers. It's from parents. You see, parents don't understand this, and parents are worried. You know, they're worried. They're scared. But, I keep telling them the answer is not to go back to the 19th century. You cannot bring the coachman back ever again. The answer lies forward, you know. But all of us have to say this and, you know, try to de-stress the system to understand that these children, there's a generation who will have to do things by themselves. Um, so anyhow, so that was one of my, the, the second part, America. Of course I've done. I've done many different sessions. The most memorable one was in Kansas City, Kansas, uh, about two years ago. I went into the school where the principal said, are you sure it's going to work here? You know, these children are very demotivated. They don't seem to be... So anyway, I met them. They were about 13 years old or so. And they're just sort of sitting there. So I said, well, um, do you, what, what are you guys doing? Oh, we are, we are working on a play. Um, I said, why? They said, they told us. <laughs> so, 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 so I said, okay. So I said, uh, well, what's a play for? So now this, what do you mean what is a play for? It's, you know, you just act. And I said, no, I have a question for you. And you can use the internet to answer it. And they said, that's not allowed. I said, it is for the next one hour. Go ahead, just pull out all your devices or use the classroom computers, whatever. My question is, what is the purpose of theater? And this is inner city Kansas, okay? 35 minutes later, I'll never forget it. 
one of these little girls stands up and she says, I would like to speak. So I said, okay, go ahead. You know, in my system, after about 30, 40 minutes, you ask the groups to present and say, okay, what have you found? So she got up, her first sentence was, theater creates its own meaning. And there was pin drop silence, huh. you know? So the answer, yes, it'll work better than anywhere over here. Just go ahead and do it, for heaven's sake. Right. Excellent. We have another question from Tara Han. She says, have you seen success with Seoul and special education students? Does it allow them more access and success? I haven't done as much on this as I should have. I've, I've done very little. But there is a teacher in England who uh, used that method with uh, autistic children. And she claims, this is her observation, she claims that it works in a very strange way with autistics. You know, the groups are self-organized, they're made by themselves. Now, autistic... Aut <laughs> well done. Excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you need an antacid? I, I'll work on that. <laughs> So the autistics, you know, there's, there's, some are good at some things and some are not good at other things. So the guy who reads well will become the reader. The guy who understands well becomes the guy who... So they make their groups almost as though they carefully calculated their individual capabilities and added them together. You know, it's amazing. But again, it needs to be tried more. We have another question here. I, I like this one. It's one that occurred to me as well. Have you been able to track the long-term outcomes and benefits for the early hole-in-the-wall kids? <laughs> this is good. from Tabletop Inventors. Good, good one. Um, but first of all, not on a, uh, on a statistical basis, again, because it's really hard. Remember, the original hole-in-the-wall environment is unsupervised, so the children who are users is, is a, a kind of a floating population. You can't quite control. And then there are new children coming in, old children going away because their parents went away and things like that. So I only have isolated instances. But my best anecdotal story happened again in this country, in Baltimore, Maryland. I was there speaking to the school superintendent's meeting. And uh, I was talking about the hole in the wall. And I, in those days, three or four years ago, I was talking about some of the original uh, experiments. And out of the audience, a young man rose, who I didn't quite know. He was Indian, but I didn't recognize him. And he said, after my talk, he said, I am one of those children from Shirgaon, <laughs> one of this quite a remote village. So I said, and what are you doing in America? He said, you know, when I was very young, we had that computer in the wall, and I was eight. And I, was, I used to read The New Scientist. Well, that's what they do at the hole in the wall. <laughs> I used to read this magazine called The New Scientist, and I decided that one day I will study biology. So that's what I'm doing in the US. I said, where? He said, I'm on a full scholarship on a PhD program on evolutionary biology in Yale. <laughs> so, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> so, so the thing is that, but. I mean, if I was the questioner, I would say, okay, nice, uh, sentimental story, but what's the big numbers? I don't know the big numbers, but I can tell you one thing. There's another way to think about it. If I take that one young man, was it not worth the million dollars? I, I would say yes. It's a good way of looking at it. Okay, we only have 200 more questions left. <laughs> uh, I want to go now to uh, new gold disc recipient Diane Maine's question. Do you think we can break the escalating cycle of achievement-driven education that's based on outdated traditions? Do you think we can break that escalating cycle just, just of achievement-driven... Just, just say it again, because that... No, might, sorry. Uh, no, just, just turn... The, yeah, no. Can we break that escalating cycle of achievement-driven education that's based on outdated traditions? How? Yeah, as, as I said... The only thing I can think of is the introduction of the cloud into the examination system, into the assessment system. I don't quite know what that will do. I mean, we'll have to think of new kinds of assessment. But one thing I do know, that why is it that there isn't a school system that uh, asks a question like, 
what's the best way to do a search on the internet? What's the quickest way to get to the right answer on the internet? Aren't these important things? Aren't these things more important than the 17 times tables? So, you know. Asking the right questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Marco Torres, who's just off stage here, uh, when he's spoken at the Q conference, he encourages educators to stay in the question. Is that not right, Marco? Uh, if you don't know, Marco Torres is here. He's a former keynote, and uh, he's with the Alas Group, and he's shooting photos and making videos. So thank you. It just occurred to me as you said that, he's standing right there, and I had to bring that up. So thank you for being here, Marco. Another question from Dennis Grice. I wonder, if children learn better in unsupervised groups, is one-to-one -one a disadvantage? It's not as though... I mean, we shouldn't generalize to say it has to be groups, it has to be lack of resources. It works if you do it that way. But does that mean that one is to one doesn't work? No, I don't think so. We should look at the instance where the child says, and I've had these instances, where the child says, I would like to work on this by myself, and let him. If he repeats that, and over a period of time you find that he's never saying that I want to work with a group, then you move. And move as in, not in a prescriptive way, but move with an experiment and say, okay, let's see, you achieved up to this point alone, let's try in a group and see, will your achievement drop? And if so, by how much? Okay, you make it a scientific experiment. Of course, what happens is usually the opposite. So I've turned around several children like that, but uh, the answer, one is to one if imposed by the system can be a disadvantage because you're not asking the learner what the learner wants. You're saying here's the, and usually those school computer rooms, I don't know how they are here, but you know, they're just a straight line of computers with chairs. So it's almost impossible to make a group around the computer, first of all. So we need to break the geometry of the room and change definitely the, break the one is to one. Yeah, and change the learning environment, the yeah, spaces change, in which the students the learn. Okay, the last question. Uh, I, I really do appreciate your generosity in letting the questions come up on stage. In fact, it was uh, Professor Mitra that said, can we do a QA? and a I really love that part of the, the talk. Um, uh, here's a potentially interesting question from Mark uh, Grisaf. Uh, Grisaf um, what is the role of administration in the sole Granny Cloud model? Well, the administration, needs to keep, in my case, uh, in the Indian uh, schools in the cloud, the administration has a very serious and important job to do. Keep the toilets clean. <laughs> I, think, I think you got the point. Okay, thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Richard. I really appreciate your time. Thank, thank you. you so much.